Right hey, on. Yeah. Is it smoky up there? Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. I, I didn't. It was fine yesterday, but it is now, man. It is now. Um, yeah, we had it yesterday and today. Today we're yeah. just socked in with the red sky and everything, you know. Yeah. Typical. Know. It's it's September. Yep. <laughs> and I feel so bad for you guys because, like, I know, like, for knowing Shane for years, he's always mentioned that it's, like, a constant problem. We've never had it. I live out in central New York. Okay. We've never had it. But last year they had, like, um, severe Canadian wildfires to where mm-hmm. we were starting yeah. to, like, yeah. get it. Yeah. And I was like, man, I cannot imagine what it's like for those guys out there who have to deal with this every year. We're so yeah. Used to it. It's so weird in in Portland because I'm like I think you're just so used to thinking that like oh end of August September summer's over and it's like no man the shitting it like the smoky weather and stuff it's just it just gets started now you know what I mean so, yeah you you think right. about so okay now here's a kind of a way to segue into talking about Keith Rosson and um yeah we just started talking about the weather like oh right. god <laughs> no. So it was 2020. Um, Donald Trump lost his mind and sent a bunch of fucking militant soldiers to the city of Portland. And we yeah. had things going on all over the place. And the whole uh, Columbia Gorge was basically up in flames and knocking on our back door in southeast Portland. Yeah. You know? And then shortly after that situation didn't resolve itself, but kind of fizzled out a little bit. Uh, I read a book called Fever House, and I'm going to segue over to you now and <laughs> have you go ahead and introduce that and the devil by name. And I mean, because when I read Fever House, it gave me chills because I was living there. It's my hometown. I right lived there, you know, and lived there for 57 years. Um, and it was like Fever House just fucking nailed you know as you got to the end of it yeah well i felt about that situation in portland you know it yeah. fever house in a way um and now uh fast forward to the devil by name you know yeah but, yeah tell us about you know, i the- guess if i had to do like a um like an elevator pitch um for folks who haven't read the books yet fever house is the first one Mm -hmm. uh that came out i think in 2022 and i wrote it during all of the uh you know the 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 long run of protests in portland Mm -hmm. you know yeah the george floyd protests and then um so that was like 2020 was in the thick of it when i was writing it and it's essentially about a pair of uh kind of leg breakers that roll up to an apartment complex in portland oregon to get money um from a client for their boss and they find a severed hand in the freezer and it's a it's a hand of unknown origin but it it um inspires anyone who gets near it uh to like just insane violence and like gleefully insane violence Mm -hmm. And so their boss, who is not only like a, you know, dope dealer, but he's also a collector of of objects, decides that he wants it. And um, beyond him, there's also a black ops uh, government agency who um, actually had ownership of it for a while and they lost it. And that's how it came into possession of this in this freezer. So it's really a kind of cat and mouse game of all these different disparate people wanting this hand and it uh eventually includes a woman named Catherine Moriarty who is a kind of agoraphobic ex rock singer um who and her son who works for the drug dealer so it's it's a it's a big book tightly plotted intricately plotted hopefully reads like a thriller like really fast you know but there's a lot of wheels on it and there's like many 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 characters you know yeah. and a, a big kind of part of it was like the uh one of the characters is pretty intrinsically involved with with the protests of that era you know and uh, i don't want to give too many spoilers away for people who haven't read it but like he is really tightly bound to that it's a law enforcement guy who's very tightly bound to um those protests because he fucked up during one of them um 
so yeah so that's the pitch for fever house and then the sequel the devil by name comes out on tuesday yep, yep. and it ostensibly takes place five years after the events of fever house and so now we get to play that little game guys yeah, of yeah. like how much do we want to give away <laughs> yeah. you know uh, what i mean you say that keith because that's the problem i had um, and Shane knows too. Like I published a review of it, and, and like I, I want to thank you personally, yeah. dude. That was such a great review. And like, you get one of the, you get you don't always get those reviewers. It's like, oh man, this guy fucking read it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And like yeah. it's a careful, thought out, measured review where it's like you put the yeah. work in, and I, I just you don't always get that. So like, thank you very yeah. much. I was, gonna mention that. I was gonna mention that too because uh rich and i have both always been that way um mm -hmm. we, we read it's weird like if we're reading for a review we read for enjoyment first mm -hmm. yeah, but we also read academically while we're doing yeah it because we want to say something substantial about it not just Oh my gosh, I loved it, which is yeah, a great review. That's a great so good. Yeah, but, but right. Yeah, let's yeah. let's get give some insight into, and, you know, how it, how we responded to it. Yeah. And it's funny because yeah. like when you said about how far we want to get into it is like writing it was hard because you want to be conscious of like spoilers, but at the same time, especially because it's a duology, like it's minor spoilers in the fact that like you have to kind of like spoil elements of fever house, but very minor mm -hmm. in order to even talk about the devil by name, just because of like the characters. Right. So I would say personally, like, and Shane, you can correct me if you, if I'm wrong, but we'll try and talk about it with maybe like, m like maybe minor spoilers more so about fever house only because you kind of need that to talk about. The yeah. Other. Let's, let's establish a rule right now. Okay. Anybody who's actually interested in the devil by name has probably read fever. House. Yeah. I imagine you're yeah. right. It's been yeah. out over a year at this point. So, so. let's go yeah. ahead and put out a big spoiler warning. There will probably be fever house. Spoilers, oh, yeah. at the very, yeah, yeah. very least. So yeah. if you haven't read either of them, yeah. and you just riveted, hit pause, read it. Yeah. You know, yeah. take a couple days, resume. There we go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Perfect. We'll go with that. Yep. Yeah. Um, because it is hard to talk about. Uh, Rich, uh, is better than me because he actually has finished it. Uh -huh. um, I was in the. I was at about the midway point and I sold a book and then all the trappings that come with <laughs> getting that ready to go. Yeah, there you go. Took over right my on, dude. life, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, congratulations. That's awesome. But uh yeah, I, good deal. I can say number one, um a guy who I like to think of as a friend of mine who doesn't know my name, has never met me, and doesn't know I exist, but we have the same initials. Um, <laughs> oh, he he and I were talking the other day, although I was just listening. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he said, hey, here's some of my favorite things. And he said, Evil, the show Evil, uh -huh. on, on uh, Netflix now, but um, from Paramount, I think. Uh, it's brilliant. We he loves it. We love it, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I can align myself with Stephen fucking King is who I'm yeah. talking. To. And he, the other thing he loves is Fever House and this series. And that I literally had a tear roll down my cheek when oh, I man. Saw it. it's like my fucking homeboy. You yeah, know? <laughs> it was. You know, we it was one of those things where like. um you know, you get you're privy to when you're with a big publisher. And I put out four books with a small publisher before I uh, landed this deal with Random House. And when you're with a big publisher, they have meetings where they're like, OK, how do we get this in front of people? And it's not just it's like a people who, you know, a group of people where it's their job. And we tried for a long time to get Stephen King on board and get a book in front of him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it just didn't happen. And then it happened pretty organically because Joe Hill, his yep. son, who's also a fucking tremendous writer, um, read it. And he just like tweeted about it or posted about it. And then Stephen King, you know, I, clearly they follow each other. So it was on his radar that way. 
Yeah. And so then they were able to get a, a copy in front of him. And uh, so my my wife and my kids and I were out to dinner and um, I look at my phone and it's a email from Stephen King. Uh, and he is just like, the book's great. Can I get the next one? And I just about, you know, I didn't necessarily shit my pants, but like it was like, <laughs> crazy. You know what I mean? Sick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it happened organically. And one of the things that really impresses me about that guy is like he has no need to uh, do what he does as far as like he constantly touts smaller writers and other yeah. projects. Yep. Doesn't have to, but like he uses, you know, uses his platform for good. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing. He has like sung that book's praises uh, like a beast, you know? Like, like he remembers where he's where he came from. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just cool. It's just, it's yeah. very humble and cool. Especially not because like he's not only because he's, you know, Stephen King, like a huge figurehead in horror, but like, with the fever house duology, you know, it's like an apocalyptic post-apocalyptic novel. And, you know, arguably Stephen King's the author of like one of the standards for that genre with the stand. Oh, absolutely. So to I have think somebody, anybody can, I think Chuck Wendig's wanderers got close, yeah. but like, that's it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. swan song, like McCammon swan song, mm -hmm. you know, but like, that's a whole different animal. Cause it's like way, those are two different books to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. Different books. All three of those, The Stand, yeah. um, Swan Song, and Wanderers yeah. are, are perfectly exemplary of the subgenre of yeah. big fiction. And and big sprawling narratives. Right, you know? right. It's like but so is Fever House, dude. I appreciate it. I it hope I mean that would be fucking amazing if it got one tenth of the kind of legs that either of those books have yeah, if they get yeah. if it gets anywhere near that i'll be very lucky you know both of the, yeah both of these books man i think are you know um um definitely up with the standard you know i, I appreciate it yeah yeah and just out of curiosity keith um when you were writing this because, like, I know kind of with the afterword of The Devil by Name, you were talking about kind of the challenges. Did you always have this in mind as a duology, or did you write Fever House, and upon the end, you realized, you know, you had more strands that you could further develop? Oh, it's it's I, way more it's way more capitalistic than that. Right. Um, <laughs> I, like, you know, Paul Tremblay, where he, he, he is so infuriatingly good at like ambiguity you know and like it's like i'm not going to give you all the answers and this ending is not happy and the ends are not tied up so fever house was written with like that was the fucking end of it right you know mm -hmm. I thought um, so. and then when we got this deal with random house my editor uh the first thing she said to me was like i don't uh i don't make this call to writers unless i'm willing to make a deal and so that blew that just like changed my life right there. But then she said, are you willing to add like 30,000 words to fever house? And are you willing to write a sequel? And so it was She's like, you don't have to, but it would be awesome if you did. And so it was purely, purely at the impetus of my editor. Cause it, you know, ran, the random house deal changed my life like a million percent. And so I was like, I will write, if you want me to write cat food commercials for you, I will do that. <laughs> you know, so I can't I, even imagine, man. So I had to, yeah, I had to till that ground, and there was so many unanswered questions. And like, I, I, I honestly, I wrote a wildly different first draft of The Devil by Name, um, and we had one of those bummer ass talks where my editor was like, "It's not quite hitting the mark, and there's not." that much at risk and the characters kind of aren't getting run through the ringer enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I rewrote the book. Right. Well, but you, you put those motherfuckers through a grinder and this right? time. this yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But so in devil by name, like they go through it in the yeah. book that comes out on Tuesday. Um, but I tried to, I tried to match that, um, that kind of crime scope 
that Fever House had. I tried to match that in this first draft of Devil, and it just didn't quite work because it was too. It was mostly centered in the Fever House of Portland five years afterwards, and so it was kind of a more self-contained story just with Bonner, you know, John Bonner. Yeah, and with and then the other characters like Catherine and and Nick and stuff, they didn't come in until like the last. 20% of the book, really. They were kind of like tangential. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just had to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're, they're important, those two characters. Yeah, absolutely. And they have, you know, they're reasonably prevalent, but like I had to get them all moving kind of towards each other a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, that's really hard to hear, you know? But you also, I mean, you, yeah, I'm, I think, I don't know what the previous product looked but as it looks now from where I'm at with it, um, it does the thing. And Rich mentioned the book that most comes to mind when um, I think about uh, Devil by Name is, and, and Fever House is it, it, you're just really getting into the character arc of this character, you know, like Bonner and his handler or whatever, you know, and then, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're into all of a sudden that chapter ends right on what feels like an almost cliffhanger and you're on to Catherine Moriarty and yeah, you know, and um, those switches like that annoy the fuck out of me. And they also make the read really tense, you know, and they're, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a hard one because it's like uh you can't half for one assuming that people have read fever house half the people that start out the book in fever house are dead by the end of it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so yeah. like you've got to introduce new characters you oh, know they're deliciously mean? dead too I yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and so um it's really a question i still i i wanted to keep that going where it was again like multi pov and a bunch of like auxiliary stuff like interviews and um transcripts and and things like that and so that's where like matthew coffin's journals come in like all this you know additional material and those become like kind of the linchpin of the plot yeah as far as like how everything comes together you know yeah. and it's and also a nice break because he's like his uh Notebooks are are written before the world goes to shit. So it's like a nice kind of return back to what is considered civilized society. So it's not all pure post-apocalyptic stuff, you know? So the reader gets kind of a break between that, even though he's a flaming asshole and, you know, uh, all that. But it's like a nice, a nice segue between current hellscape and previous, you know, somewhat civilized world. Yeah. And, th and that's kind of one of the things. And again, for people who haven't read either of these, please go read them because it's kind of a. Yeah, what are you doing? Come on. Little spoiler. But yeah. that element of the journals, like you said, for the, for the majority of both books, like you said, he's a flaming asshole. But then, like, when you kind of read those journals, especially more towards the later entries, and, yeah. like, that's one of the things, like, with your books and the characters, is, like, all of these characters have kind of these satisfying arcs. Is like, he is a very self-absorbed asshole of a person. But then when you get to those later entries, as misguided as he was and as mean as he was he almost kind of realizes that he's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's trying to like too. do whatever yeah. he can to like mend that. Yeah, totally. He is like, you know, not to give too much away, but he is kind of at the mercy of other things as well, you know? Mm -hmm. And that to me is like such the fun part of writing is like, can you convince people that these characters are not just flat one dimensional good guys or bad guys that's the challenge you know it is. it's important i think and it's also i mean once again to you know reference earlier books i, I won't keep naming them but um, oh please do it um, isbn's everything dude yeah <laughs> <laughs> um to, to, well i mean to reference you know the ones we've spoken of like king and uh especially king and wendig in this case yeah each character arc 
could be the POV for the whole story. Mm -hmm. Just about, you know what I mean? And yeah, and totally. That's important to me, you know, as as a reader that you've got these like I could take this whole character arc and and that's why I say jokingly it annoys me when I get to a section the end of a chapter and it goes nope on to Catherine. It's like right. motherfucker, I'm reading this story. I know. <laughs> you yeah. know? And Funny that's though, I honestly have never I've got six novels out, no, five novels and a story collection. I have never written a longer work, novel length work, where it's just one POV. Yeah. Every single book has either multiple or at least two characters that they bounce back and forth. And I think that's kind of a, a, a bit of a crutch. I'm way more comfortable doing it, you know? So like one of my goals is eventually I'm gonna do that and just it's just gonna be one character um, mm -hmm. all the way through. So I am not even close to that yet, but one of these days I want to get there. <laughs> yeah, because when you say that, I think about uh, Road Seven in particular, and um, I can't. I'm sorry, I forget the name, but it has smokes in it. Yeah, Smoke City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and those yeah. bounce. Those are just two characters, but they bounce back and forth. Yeah. 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 But and but it's like. Uh, yeah, I'm forever grateful to Trisha Reeks for uh, hitting me with Smoke City, and then oh man, Meerkat Press did my first four books, and they are such a fantastic press. They are. And I think they're like, I think because she's a little adventurous and doesn't just stick to one genre, mm -hmm. that she, I don't think Meerkat gets the kind of kudos that it deserves. You know. Yeah. Because it's yeah. not just a, they've won awards. Like, their books have won multiple awards. But for whatever reason, it's like, it's not, they do, like, they're, I think they're doing a thriller right now. And they're doing, you know, they do fantasy stuff and, and yeah. horror stuff. And But they've published Jen Brucolar. Yeah. They, Which they that book was fantastic. now. Yeah. And they, they re reissued the cipher, you know? Yeah, I mean? exactly. Like, cipher, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're done important work there yeah they're tremendous absolutely and sh i credit her with like i mean it's one of the nice things is that um with fever house kind of getting picked up and still holding steam a year plus later is that my other books have really picked up as well like the back catalog and so that <clears throat> helps me but it also helps her you know and like i feel like yeah. indebted to her you know because she like right took a risk on like road seven was a COVID book. You know what I mean? It came out like yeah. two months after COVID, like during lockdown, you know what I mean? And it's still by far my worst selling book. And she just had, you know, she loves it. Like she's just awesome. Great editor, great publisher. Yeah. And I'm going to do a little pimping here before Rich uh, steps in here and say <laughs> road seven. It is absolutely fucking criminal for it to be your worst selling book. Yeah, oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank Dude. you. <laughs> it's it's the best of the Meerkat books, I think. Oh, you wow. Know? I appreciate oh, it. Right. You know, yeah, it doesn't well, really get that much attention, you know? Yeah, it, it was, I think, not a lot of books that came out then actually did real super well at that point. Yeah, I don't think so. I think we were very, yeah. you know, obsessed with everyone dying and all yeah, that. So, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We, and yeah. We have, <laughs> I was gonna say I, when he said that, like when you said because you knew I was gonna jump in there, like I was blown. <laughs> like I've been on record as that was like one of the first novels and also one that like really connected with me. And so, like when he said that, I was kind of surprised because, like, I feel like people who have read it really love it. I think that's true. Yeah. 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 Yep. But one thing that was interesting, and I know it probably has no bearing on it. In fact, I'm pretty quite confident because they're vastly different books. But one of the first things, like when I started getting into like the fever house lore and like, you know, the ritual that kind of plays into everything that happens. Yeah. I instantly thought about road seven and how he and had the scarring death. and all that. Yeah. 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 And I was like, I know they're completely different related. You know, they're not even related. But I was like, how cool would that be if that was somehow, you know, yeah, tangentially and tied to that? <laughs> I can't I can't even think of the guy's name. 
but I think Sandoval, I know, is the last. Right, but like the bad guy in Road Seven. Oh um, yeah, I love that you I, can't think of his name. I can't. I can't. I mean, after six books, and they all have twenty <laughs> characters. Oh, and God, yeah. I know I'm doing that shit with my own stuff all the time. Yeah, it's like you have to make sure that, like, okay, so I used Nick at least one or two books ago. I got to do something different, you know. But, (laughs) uh, but he runs like that kind of clandestine government thing, and it would be cool if, like, the the kind of agency from there and Arc from Fever House were able to kind of like butt heads or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and that's what's interesting is that, like, like you said, they're not really related, but that yeah. kind of plays into that theme. Like when uh, Shane and I talked with Kathy, mm-hmm. and she kind of talks about, like, you know, the artist has their own intention when they write the story, but once it's out there, people kind of relate to themselves and make all these connections, and that's kind of what I mean. Is like, you yeah. didn't mean for those to be connected, but that's kind of where my mind went. Was like, oh, what if that organization? And it's fucking fun when that happens, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, yep. That's one of the like the um the lasagna from Road Seven, the yeah. lasagna television show. I picked up on that too. Also. I have made it a mission to fit that in. I'm actually writing a short story right now where um. And I don't know. It's I'm struggling with it a bit. God knows why. But um, <laughs> so the the puppeteer and the voice actor for the old lasagna show, it's getting a reboot, and so they're vying hard to be like the voice actor and the puppeteer for it. And uh, they run into Hutch and Tim, so it's like a pre Fever House story, and they, awesome. they owe money to you know um, some to Peach, so. It's kind of a fun way to tie a lot of that shit together. You know what Doesn't I mean? Have a home? No, I haven't even. It sucks. It really oh, okay. sucks right okay. now. So well, I got to wrap it up. See the okay. pitch you well, gave us, though. I'm like, I need to read this. Like, it's fun. Yeah, really? it's a fun idea. <laughs> and I, that's one of yeah. the things that I love about King so much mm-hmm. is the vastness of his world and how he drops those breadcrumbs. You know? Um. Yeah, and like even something that a lot of people hated but i loved is that uh his son joe hill um wrote the fireman Mm -hmm. and dropped a bunch of stephen king no way i haven't read that That one feels too unwieldy to me oh i haven't haven't tackled it yet yeah i did did. it has its big points and its low points you know but he also um the 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 Christmas land one. I can't remember the name now. Nosferatu. Yeah. Nosferatu. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That also drops a bunch of King. Uh, nice. Right on Easter eggs. Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. That's crazy. I know I read that one. Huh? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm happy that I, I discovered Joe Hill and read his first two books before I knew he was Stephen King. And the reason I'm happy about that is because that, because that way I knew he was fucking legit, not just Stephen King's son. You yeah, know? and I think that's a that was like it sounds like a very one million percent intentional choice. Mm-hmm. That, you know what I mean? Yep, yep, yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. But I digress. <laughs> yeah, again, and that's another dude that like it feels so casual to be like, yeah, he's really cool. But yeah. like that's another guy who was like super nice. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And it's just like, yeah, like we're doing a, um, I'm flying out to the University of Maine in October. Cool. And so it was like a long shot. And I was like, do you want to do like a Q&A about Fever House and Devil when I'm out there? And he's like, yeah, I'll do that. Fuck yeah. You know what I mean? Like, awesome. it's like way bigger, way bigger writer than I am, you know? And the bookstore is asking like what books he wants to like you know for, to be for sale or whatever and he's like i don't really care this is more about us getting people introduced to your books you know what i mean like mm-hmm. that's cool like that's very generous of the guy yeah um, yeah and that's the thing though that you've said about both you know king yeah. and i've heard about hill as well is that um those guys are constantly uplifting other authors. I mean, like I remember when Paul Tremblay was just coming into his own, you know, he had, 
as a horror writer. He had other stuff that he'd written, but then he wrote A Head Full of Ghosts. Mm -hmm. And he wrote uh, Disappearance at Devil's Rock. And he got Joe Hill's notice. And Joe Hill started just hammering his work into mm -hmm. things, you know. And it's like, yeah. I think that's really fucking cool when big authors do stuff like that. Yeah. And Paul is like, again, one of the big names. And he does a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Um, and so it's like, I'm hard pressed to like come up with like, I guess you can see people who are, who are like, oh, I kind of mostly stick to my own side of the street, but also mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that like you, you know, use their powers for good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. It's like Josh Mallerman, mm -hmm. that guy, you know, he's like, yeah, really. It, I mean, he's one of those few great big huge name authors that i count as a personal friend that i wish mm -hmm. my mom was alive so i could tell her it was yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah right but, totally. but it's mostly not because of his status as an author right because of his and allison's status as humans and creators right. you know they're just totally uplifting with other you know, and it's cool to be able to to kind of thread that needle of like, oh, I make a living as a writer. Right, right. Very handsomely or, or what, successfully, you know. Yeah. And I'm able to do this and not be a cock about it. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. that is like, yeah, that's awesome. So, um, uh, no, don't ask that question yet. That's a spoiler. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh tell us a little bit about how the process differed with devil by name versus uh fever house i mean because I, I can't imagine like it's your like your first sequel right yeah 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 so there's a lot of i feel like if i were writing this stuff the sequel would have a lot different approach than the first book you know yeah and like i said i wrote i wrote a draft and mm -hmm. i used maybe 15 percent yeah. of it ultimately you know mm -hmm. yeah after that yeah. that disastrous meeting with my editor and it wasn't disastrous because she's no. really good and and all yeah. that it was a little disheartening you know but i knew it at the same time i fucking yeah. knew it yeah you know? um there's a question of like oh it's passably good but like people don't want passably good you know uh -uh. So it was tough because Fever House ends on such a cliffhanger and in such a tightly constrained set of circumstances that it was really hard to let, you know, because everybody knows like it, it essentially ends with the message, which is this like this message that anybody who answers their phone is kind of driven mad and driven to violence. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's certainly not everybody, but it's a sizable enough, you know, you get 2% of the world afflicted with that we are right. fucked. the whole world is fucked you know what i mean especially if it's contagious you know and so um there was a really tight set of parameters that i had to stick with and it's like how do you tell a story that's not just like fever house 2.0 you know um yeah yeah where it's not just like a, a total like 15 minutes after the first book and and kind of a retread of it and right. so i kind of flexed a little bit as far as like enhance the scope of it so it takes place kind of almost globally you know what i mean yeah yeah and it was really hard and like you know my my <laughs> wife would be like how'd writing go and i'd be like oh but <laughs> 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 it's the worst thing i've ever written and um it was just hard to like I feel like it's a it's a growth in regards to like what I've written before, you know, and uh, it was really hard. Um, where like Fever House, I didn't have an agent. It was like I didn't have a deal, you know. It was just like I was just writing to like not lose my mind during COVID and and oh, after yeah. COVID, you know. And so the the two were very different experiences, and there was a lot of pressure, you know. Mm -hmm. to like um because there was a lot of buzz around fever house when it was like when it was bought and everything and yeah. um like industry buzz and uh yeah. so there was a lot of pressure to kind of keep 
that momentum going, you know, and like, I don't know how well I did with it, but it's like, it's a different book, but it's the best book I could have written at the time, you know? And there, that's an interesting thing I find too, um, just to uh, relate a personal experience, my recent experience, the book I told you I sold, mm -hmm. um, that I, I wrote with a partner. Yeah. Um, we started it September two years ago. Um, and then I, you know, hit a bunch of shit storms in life, you know, just the way life does. And yeah, um, over and over and over. So it, it ended up, you know, to long story short, it ended up being um, the hardest book I had ever written because yeah. I just kept coming up against walls and then I'd go to write and I'd just be exhausted or I just wouldn't have anything in there, you know? Yeah. That same thing you said, oh, it just ain't working, you know? Then yeah. From all that uh, controversy and all that uh, conflict in, in life at that point in time, all that trauma, um, I wrote what I think between me and Stephanie Ellis is the best book we've written. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah, it, it was it's, hard. And yeah, you put your nose down and, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and came out with the best book you've written. Yeah. And it's to me, it's just like it's it's that like almost especially when I start a new book. But and with this one having to start over again, there is that background hum of fear of like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't fucking do it. I yeah. had it. <laughs> and now i'm joking and i can't do it you know mm -hmm. and uh and especially when there's a publisher involved in advance yeah, yeah and 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 yeah and a deadline and expectations and you know and um thankfully it was you know i would occasionally get little blips of like oh i can see the end of this or oh that's a cool idea i know where that's going or oh i want to put that in but most of the time it was like pretty hard you know mm -hmm. um and then thankfully, like I do probably 12 edits at least like from page mm -hmm. one to the end before I ever show it to anybody, you know? Um, and so eventually around like, that's not true, probably eight, eight edits before I show it to somebody, <laughs> but eventually around like four or five, um, you start to see like, it's, it's, you know, it starts with a skeleton and then it starts to fatten up a little bit and get muscle and all that. And it's like, eventually you're like, oh yeah, okay, this is working. And it's got, the pieces are, are working and, and things are happening. And there's still some loose spots that I got to clean up, but like, okay, you know? And so it's really a question most of the time of like working through that pants shitting terror, you know? Right, right. Kind of, you hit that stage where you got to erase pencil lines and trust your ink. Yeah, and right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a, a lot of it is, yeah, just like, okay. Uh, that avenue didn't work. We're doing this one yeah. and we're going to kind of stick with it. You know, yeah. it's really like, it's like what I, what I tell newer writers where they're, you know, people who work on the same 15 pages or 20 pages. And then it's like, once they get, once I get that done, when it's perfect, I'll be able to move on. And my experience is just like giving myself the luxury of a really shitty sprawling, sloppy first draft mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because by the time i get to page 300 i know a lot more about the characters and i can go back and kind of pencil in how they would be in page one you know because i don't know who they are yet until i finish the fucking book yeah yeah, yeah. and it's it's not quite the same but like when you were kind of talking about like the pressure like i've mentioned this on i think an episode with josh because he's a musician i know you've kind of worked in that world too i would do air quotes on work but yeah sure <laughs> oh dude you've created some killer art though yeah, yeah right right but yeah for yeah. like a lot of bands that we like and yeah. like with fever house like you said there wasn't that it's kind like there wasn't that expectation yeah it's kind of like what people say about bands you know they have their whole career as a band to put out that first album right. and that's why like sometimes it's like this huge work and then like you know it might be just as good but people are more critical of the other because now they've got such a shorter window 
to try and fit that all in. So I can imagine like the pressure of it, but like hearing you talk about how, you know, you wrote it and like hearing you say that it mainly focused on Bonner with that first draft. Yeah. Like one of my favorite characters of the book, he, I would imagine based off of that information, he probably wasn't even in that first draft is Dean Haggerty, the rag. Yeah, I don't think he was in it. No, he might, he was in it. I think he was in it. Yeah, he was. But okay. again, a much more like kind of tertiary, like, like even more of a secondary character, you know, I loved him right off the bat because you know, everything is so shitty, like in terms of like whatever. Yeah, that was really good. sweet. Yeah. And he's kind of like, yeah, I just want to, you know, make connections with people. Right, and, right. You know, do this face to face thing. And like yeah. that ray of like hope through it because, you know, everything else was so bleak. You know, you have. Oh, it's a fucking book, dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you have <laughs> Catherine with her loss. You have. You yeah. Know, the leg breakers basically <laughs> like right. all these people. And then you've got Dean who's just like, yeah, yeah. I kind of want to like make friends and trade. Right. Yeah. Enjoy the, <laughs> what is left of the world. The yeah. Local. I don't think that that was intentional. Honestly. Um, it is a relentlessly fucking dour book in spots. You know what I mean? And it's like, but yeah. then try to, you know, try to, to lay some daisies down Mm-hmm. you know five years after the message like i you know i challenge you to do that like it's you know it's a, again a, a really tough set of parameters but yeah i i love that that dean is kind of seen as this like lighter you know because he's a very serious dude and has like his own trauma and all that shit but i love the fact that he's seen as like kind of the like all right the breath of fresh air in this book mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um yeah, yeah. uh Sorry, I forgot where I was going there. So go ahead, Rich. No, my bad. I was just going to say, you know, kind of like the whole breath of fresh air thing. I just want to say, I i don't think I've ever read a book like this, but it makes all the sense. And this is right from like the publisher copy, the whole thing with Teradyne. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think I've read a post-apocalyptic book like where like a corporation steps in, but it makes all the sense in the world. Especially where, where is, well, yeah, right. Exactly. How our world yeah. is now. So relevant. Yeah. yeah. To where they'd be like, you know what? Yeah. Everybody's suffering and we can capitalize on this. Right. And we have the infrastructure <laughs> where the government doesn't necessarily have it. We can fill in the spots and yeah, totally. Yep. Also in partnership. Like, late mm-hmm. spoiler warning. We just spoiled the shit out of a tiny bit. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's on the that's on the book cover. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, and if you've read Fever House, you know all about that. Shit. Yeah, it's a coming. It's a coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, all in all, it's fascinating. Um, and I think, and I, I guess your agent and Random House agree with me. Um, important story. The whole story from Fever House through, uh. The devil by name. Um, I just hope, it's, it's I hope so, so man. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is because it's so fucking relevant. You know, like mm-hmm. I just said a while ago, it's just yeah. No, we don't have the message, and we don't have that hand. You know, that I'm sure is still sitting under a garbage can in Portland, <laughs> Oregon, somewhere. <Right>. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel it when I walk the streets of Southeast Portland. Yeah, there you go. There, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it just feels like it's it's relevant to our times and and the uh, things that we should be i don't know cognizant of around yeah this. just yeah, yeah it's i mean first and foremost i want to write like shit that's fun honestly mm-hmm. like shit that's fun could go on a t-shirt right right <laughs> and you've um, always written shit that's fun man. yeah that's and course, you've succeeded <laughs> it's and and it's like i i want to write something that's propulsive and readable and is on a sentence level mm-hmm. enjoyable you know what i mean yeah um and i feel like and honestly after that then the bigger overarching things come in you know yeah. um almost yeah. unwittingly Mm-hmm. You know, because I am like, I feel like a pretty good writer, but I'm not the brightest man in the world, you know? And so See, a lot of these things kind of like 
find themselves sneaking in uh, without me being a million, a hundred percent aware of it. You know, I fucking, yeah, I, I love that though, because that's kind of how I do it too. It's like, I want to write for me. It's, it's the, the linguistic approach because yeah. I'm mostly a poet um, right. that I want to write, you know, I started out as a songwriter. I'm mostly a poet now, sometimes a fiction writer. So I'm hunting for the most beautiful words, the words mm -hmm. that just feel good and sound good and taste good on my tongue. And yeah, you know what I mean, and then, every, then after the fact, people say, Oh, I love how you applied the theme of, and mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, wow. I did. But that's also like what Rich was yeah. talking about oh, how <laughs> you get to, as a reader, you get to yeah. ascribe your own connections, you know? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. And, it's funny because like when like when Shane says that, like, you know, he shares with me a lot of his work and like, you know, rightly or wrongly, like, I don't necessarily know what inspired him to like write his poetry, but yeah. like anytime he sends me something like I can tell like what he's saying about like how he likes it on a linguistic level. Yeah, that comes across too. But like sometimes I'll be like, oh, I like this poem because same thing xyz i have no idea if that's yeah. what he wants people to mm -hmm. get out of it right. but at least from the linguistic thing you know i know that you know by the fact that i feel anything at all probably for him is like a success and kind of like you with the whole overarching thing yeah i'm sure that like that's kind of i think what makes it resonate is that and i've heard a couple authors talk about this is where like you're just kind of writing from a place of like your own emotions and experiences yeah i think you're blind and it to a lot of consciously goes yeah. like yeah i think you're blind to a lot of it you know and then mm -hmm. after the fact you can start to maybe th you know like insert those bigger ideas and and kind of uh, shape the narrative around it and stuff yeah um, even, i mean yeah sometimes you'll notice them yourself and then you can develop them right you know? yeah yeah but, but other that, times it's like thank god you guys aren't expected to get what i wanted yeah to get out of the book and you <laughs> yeah. get to, you know what i mean how fucking miserable would that be and like oh, shit. Exciting. <laughs> like everybody gets to experience like trying the to listen thing. to a song and being like, well, what the singer actually means is like, come on, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's what, you know, one of the biggest things that uh, I encounter as a poet and the thing that has been a stickler with some readers, not many, but a few is that I refuse to answer the question. What does this mean? It's like, Oh, oh man. This it means a bunch of shit to me, man, but what does it mean yeah. to you? You know, because that's what's yeah. important to me as a writer, as a songwriter and a poet, you know, is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, what does it's it very mean? funny because Robin will try to uh, ask questions about that, mm -hmm. like that, about books. And I have to very narrowly, like, pew, pew, pew. Yeah, dogs. And she always gets <laughs> supremely annoyed about it, which I think is fantastic, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's funny cool you guys mention that because, like, I heard something that kind of ties into this. Like, uh, Jim Adkins, the singer of Jimmy Eat World, like, okay. you know, he has a bunch of these songs, and like, he, I don't know that he made I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but somebody asked him about it, and he almost said that, like, those songs, because you know, when people hear those songs, or even like readers with writers. They kind of want to believe that like those come from like a personal thing. And he almost was like, you know, the feeling was personal. And he's like, but I almost imagine it as like a fictional, per like these are fictional people. This didn't really happen to me. Yeah, I felt this feeling, but I kind of just shaped the fictional thing. And then people are kind of bummed because they're right. like, oh, well, I expected it to be this. So yeah, I, feel like I, it's I love almost, that ambiguity. I don't want, I don't want answers. You know what I mean? I don't want to be, uh, I don't necessarily want every thread to be tied off for me, you know, like leave some, like, let me live in yeah. 
frustrating wonder for a little bit. <laughs> and like, and, yeah. You know what I mean? And like, I, I get to like, like have some ambiguity where as a reader, I get to be like, what, do, what, what was that about? Mm. How did that ending work? What, you know, like, and that's, that's, what was so that's great the about joy that. of reading, you know? Yeah. That was what was so great about, uh, you know, your books is because like you give people enough, like kind of backstory about what's going on and like people can kind of figure out what the characters are and the forces are that are behind everything that's going on. It has familiar touchstones, but with your own kind of spin on it, but you leave yeah. a little bit there to where you're like, okay, well, why did this character do this? Or why yeah. is the person trying to initiate all these things? Um, and that's kind of what I liked about it was that ambiguity, but even on like a minor level, like, and this isn't, anything like a major spoiler but with the providence initiative and jane i was mm -hmm. like okay why jane what is jane why did they oh, man. Do the jane character yeah i will fully i actually did write a sequel to the mercy of the tide um, okay and so Start. this notion of like a rebuilt government uh kind of I kind of pulled that from Mercy and this notion of Jane was way more prevalent in the Mercy of the Tide sequel um, and had like a biography of her and all this stuff. But like that idea, I just couldn't let go of, of this like national spokesperson. And it was the same with Hutch, like Hutch in Fever House was, I tried like two crime novels with Hutch Holtz as a character. And he just wouldn't gel because I can't write straight crime even as much as I want to. So, like, I fully, uh, like, rip stuff off, like, rip off the remains from pieces that don't work and put them in other pieces, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's where Jane came from, was a yeah. sequel to Mercy that uh, just didn't quite work. Yeah. Keith, Keith can uh, write damn near straight crime. Crime, though, if he really puts, I mean, short stories, I can. Yeah, yeah, short yeah. I was gonna say, there's a story on Inkaius that. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, and I want to do more. Like that's like you know I've said it before. I can write about two guys like bullshitting with each other before they hit a dude with a hammer like all day long. <laughs> like, that is my sweet spot, you know. Um, but maintaining that over a 300 page book, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to do it yet. I have tried and tried and tried to produce any kind of crime fiction or even, you know, um, narrative poetry. And it just, I mean, something weird and slithery always slides out between the, you know. That's the same with me. I, I, I can't write straight literary fiction or crime yeah. or pick a genre without a fucking ghost or a robot. <laughs> or a werewolf coming out you know what i mean yeah. you just can't do it yeah it's like people tell me sometimes like oh your poetry is almost literary and what they mean is you got some weird shit in your poetry so it yeah can't be right, right. <laughs> totally yeah it's almost there yeah, yeah. <laughs> right but i feel yeah. like that kind of like uh for both you guys because shane i know you've you've sent me some of your poetry that kind of had like noir tones to it and like i don't know how it feels for you as like the creator of the piece but i love them and like i feel like with you keith too the same kind of thing like it's because you said you have a tendency to always put like the weird shit in there the robot and the whatever and yeah, that's yeah. kind of what i think was cool about fever house in this book is it's like a mashup of like all of that weird stuff but like the trappings of not just crime with like the small time, you know, yeah. um, leg breakers like Hutch and Tim, but yeah. also like the espionage aspect of like this whole shadow government. So yeah, like it's, a, it's, it's a grab bag. on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a grab bag of stuff. And it really is like to me, 90% of the game is like, how do I entertain myself? You mm -hmm. know, and like write stuff that's gonna be fun for me. You know, that's the most important part of writing, I think, or 
or making art in general, you know, or music or anything. Yeah. You know, I've played I've played gigs where I was playing music that I knew how to play extensively well, but didn't actually enjoy playing, you know, and then you're just yeah. making money. You're not having fun at all, you know. Right. And I, I think that's where the crime stuff where it's like I just can't <laughs> sustain those beats. Yeah. I love yeah. to read it. I love mm -hmm. to read a good, you know, crime novel. But as yeah. a writer, like I gotta explore the I gotta I gotta build a world a little bit, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm the same way. I have to I have to uh like I can't ever be an outliner, whether it's music, poetry, or fiction, just because I have to be discovering right along with everybody else, you know. Yeah, all right. Yeah. It's huge to me when a writer says Oh, I didn't write it for you. I wrote it for me because I was enjoying the story, you know, and I mean, in a nutshell. And it's like, that's hugely important, I think, to yeah. a good story is that the writer first, especially if he's like you and he's fucking great at his job, just accept that. Um, um, yeah. If you're enjoying it, everybody else in the room is going to enjoy it too. So keep doing what you do, brother. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I also think there's there comes a point where it's like, okay, I could navel gaze the shit out of this section, mm -hmm. but I also understand that people will be reading this. So I got to pull that back a little bit. You know what I mean? And yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, Cause so you got to toe that line between like, mm -hmm. oh man, I could just run with this. But also, I got a hundred thousand words to tell a story. So, what am I going to do? You yeah. know, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's it's finessing that that can be the challenge if you're writing, you know, the crime slash ghost werewolf ass stories. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a question for you out of the blue. I started to ask it earlier, but it was too soon. Um, is it a trilogy? I don't think so. I yeah. think it's going to be a yeah. tour and then we've got like, can't announce anything yet, but like if there's like media, like film or TV stuff that gets legs and actually yeah. lands, I could Ooh. see Brandon House being like, Hey, what do you think about book three? Right. And like, I have like little, uh, I don't want to lay anything out right now, but like I could do a book through, I could do a third book and I know where it would go and all that. Um, but as it is now, like I feel pretty good with with the ambiguity of book two. Yeah, yeah. I um, I will probably finish tonight. Um, nice. But I can't, uh, you know, can't speak to it yet. It's. I'm I don't sure. think it's as as like annoying as the first book's cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, I think it ties up a little bit better. Yeah. I love ambiguity in a story. If it ends ambiguous, that's fine. If it yeah. ends with your character hanging by this finger somewhere, I'm not super so happy with it. But, yeah. I mean, Arthur Conan Doyle did that, and I never read him again. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was like to go back to a, like another author's book, like Keith mentioned, like with Keith, who also does that. Man, a cabin at the end of the world. I remember you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seeing the reactions to that. I because I read that a little bit after it yeah. had come out. And I remember people reading that and being basically like, yo, Paul, what the fuck? Like, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have resisted the urge to be like, so what happened? Was it, yeah, was yeah. it real? Yeah, what happened, it's man? Psycho. No. <laughs> no. And he, I'm, I mean, I'm sure he does, but he might not even know who fucking knows, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Right. Um, yeah. That's the, that's a good book. Cause it leaves you with that fury <laughs> afterwards, you know, <laughs> that like emotion of like, ah, you know, that's a good yeah. one. And the yeah. same with like, even cause it was the same thing too, with the movie, like, uh -huh. you know, which, I haven't seen the movie. I won't spoil it. It's it's pretty much like, but it gives you the same kind of feeling as the book, and that people right. were like, oh, you know, maybe with the movie, and it's kind of like, eh, it's still kind of you're going to be like, what? The fuck is going yeah, on? yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> right. Oh, you're talking about the movie that doesn't actually mention that Paul wrote the book and doesn't use the actual book title, right? That one. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, yeah. I I've always been like. 
because I know that like they didn't do that, but like I feel like he was still like proud of it. I I don't know. Right. I mean, it's still oh, that was, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, I I hate when that happens though, because there's been a couple instances of that, and you're like, oh, I had no idea this was a book first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what else is coming up for you, Keith? So the cool thing was after uh, we wrapped um, the Devil by Name, Random House bought two more books uh, from so, me. So, awesome. So, so right I've on. got a book called Coffin Moon coming out next year. Um, and that's going to be a 1970s crime vampire thing. Um, kind of like True Grit with vampires. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's about a Vietnam veteran and his um, like adoptive niece um, going to hunt the vampire that slaughtered their family. Um, and then after that, I have another one that's like, I think it's going to, I think it's a witch book. Again, first draft, I'm maybe halfway done, but it's a witch, witch book. So I take those tropes of like crime and something else and just kind of twist it into something and i think this is a witch one so um, and that should be out like 20 26. all right so. i think uh i will squee after we're off the air but... <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay. yeah <laughs> and then hopefully they like like the books and we get to do a couple more you know i oh, really yeah. want to do another story collection at some point um and i've got enough stories for it mm -hmm. and um yeah i have some big like big ideas like it's it's hard to write them but the ideas come reasonably easy you know so um, that's my curse I, yeah uh, i i generate ideas like they're going out of style you know like you know by the handful and then yeah the, right uh the writing part that's the of. tough part man yeah, yeah totally <laughs> Well, that's uh, even like a piece of lasagna story. Yeah. Like, I know he says that it's not ready, but I, I still yeah. think we need to have that story. <laughs> yeah, I want I want to get that one done for sure. Yep. So, and again, that's just because like I love those little breadcrumbs of like world building and the interconnectedness of of books, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess I will go ahead and wrap this up. Rich, uh, you have anything else you were burning? Oh, no, there was something I wanted to ask you, though, Keith, now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, totally personal shit. If you ever get down to this area, we have a really good punk scene, man. Come hang out. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I got to tell you, uh, I, so one of the bands that was uh, pretty heavily influence influencing uh the blank letters from fever house yeah. was bikini bikini kill nice. um, and i saw them in springfield in yeah. 1995 i think at the roller skating rink there i was gonna say at the mm -hmm. rink yeah yeah and you had to get uh you got a ticket and you got a pair of roller skates and so <laughs> if you wanted to see the band you had to actually skate by them because they were playing in the corner of the <laughs> ring <laughs> and it was one of the goddamn funnest shows I've ever been to in my life. Such a great idea. Yeah, we get some oh. good ones now, though. I think that would be a blast. But, like, we just had uh, Goldfinger and the Interrupt. All right. And, you know. Awesome. So, yeah. And they're pretty uh, intimate venues, too. So Yeah, that's so cool, man. Right on. Awesome. We'll have to get down there. Yeah, definitely do, you know. Yeah. And I'll be up in Portland again soon, so I'll, awesome. I'll see if we can hook up. But, yeah, let's do it. Um, Keith Rawson, uh, if you haven't read Fever House, unfuck that right now. <laughs> um, because on Tuesday, four days from now, you are going to want uh, The Devil by Name. Um, oh, and yeah, it's, I was going to say, Keith has really? the hardback sitting right there. Yeah gorgeous um i love how punk the covers are on both of these books too they oh. feel like they could sit on a rancid album 
covers. Yeah, you know, Ella Latham uh, created the covers, and she did such an awesome job. She did uh, The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. Oh, she did that yeah. cover. So tremendous designer. She is so good. I hope she does all my books. I'm a oh, designer, yeah. and so, like, I've done all my uh, previous novels, uh, the covers for them, and it was really hard to let go. And then I saw the cover, and I was like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she nailed both of them. Yep. Um, and it's a, a last remarkable note here. Uh, Keith is also legally blind, and he's That's right. If you look at the uh, cover to Road Seven, especially, yeah, um, you will discover that blindness does not <laughs> necessarily yeah. disability. Yeah, you know, <laughs> determination yeah. counts for a lot. Um, yeah, totally. It's it was it's yeah. tremendous fun. I don't do a lot of design anymore these days just because yeah. writing takes yeah. so much time. But yeah, it's I love it, man. It's so fun. Yeah, yeah, and you're good at it. Thank um, you. Uh, it has been wonderful talking to you, man. Everybody, buy this book, buy all of Keith's books. Um, I cannot cannot praise this guy enough or his works. Um, I'm only Shane Keen, not Stephen King, but I endorse this <laughs> message. You guys need to read this guy. So, hey, I appreciate it. Your percent. Thank you for being here, Keith. Awesome. Yeah, thank Keith. thank you, you, guys. Yeah. Right yeah. on. We love you guys. Love you too, man. See ya. All right. Take it easy. <laughs>